What's up everybody? Welcome back to Guitar Wishes, your guitar wish of the day. This is Lee coming to you once again from a beautiful facility down here in Lincoln, North Carolina. We're very excited today. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit down on Zoom with uh, a guitar player who's done it all. Uh, uh, guitar player for the band Blind Melon. That's right. Roger Stevens sat down with us for over an hour and told us some great stories, some things that never been told. Talked about Shannon Hoon, uh, the death of Shannon Hoon. A lot of stuff happened, and we're going to divide it up into a couple of different parts. But here comes part one. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Hey man. Well, first, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, you know, when I when I put the the feeler out to you, um, I I had heard that you guys were going to uh, be releasing some new stuff. But then we talked on the phone and it was like really soon. And mm -hmm. so and it turns out tomorrow you've got two brand new tracks hitting. Um, and tell me about these. Now I've been privileged enough to, to hear these and these are incredible, incredible songs. Tell me about uh, recording in 2020 and how this came about. Uh, well, um, you know, we, we were scheduled to go out. Christopher, uh, the other guitar player, Christopher Thorne, he has a studio out in Joshua Tree. And uh, he's been producing the, tr the stuff that we've been doing up until now in his studio. And um, doing mixes, you know, he mixed everything as well. But we, uh, so we went out there, uh, I'm trying to think. We actually recorded a couple of tracks that were released at the end of last year, and those were done in Los Angeles. He had a studio in Silver Lake, which he sort of moved out of and moved out there. Hey, you know, pretty good timing, actually. And um, and then, uh, and, and, and so we, we did recording on some basic tracks there, and our plan was to go out and finish the whole thing in like a week. We were going to do, uh, and this was uh, would have been right after everything got shut down. Right, right. We had tickets and a plan, for, you know, for two months and had blocked out time and uh, we were going to stay and record about 10 to 12 songs. And um, and so uh, I want to make this. Yeah, it look like I'm talking to you. Good. OK, so now I'm looking at you. I didn't. OK, sorry. You know, I'm a, little, I'm a rookie. But um, so uh, so we ended up uh, just. Uh, you know, when, when, when the shutdown happened, we had to stop and, and, and we didn't go out there. You know, I had a ticket. I was going to leave like two days later. We ended up um, recording remotely on those two that you heard. And I actually did some a, a fair bit of the guitars and the two that came out at the end of last year uh, here in my space. You know, right. and I'm here. Yeah. And so now tell me about the writing process now. I mean, is it just you or is it you and Christopher? Uh, is or is everybody involved? I know you know uh, historically, Blind Melon has been you know every you know on the album covers uh, written by everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that still the uh, the philosophy? Well, everybody's writing, uh, but you know because you know we live all over the place. <laughs> you know, I mean, we do get together and write, and like um, so. The two songs that are coming out tomorrow, Travis wrote one of them. Mm -hmm. and and uh, Christopher wrote the other one, uh, I think, like pretty much all of it. And um, I don't know, maybe Travis had some, some. Uh, I really don't know, I have to ask them. I mean, he may have written the lyrics to that, uh, the second one. But, um, and you know, I have songs that we just haven't gotten to yet that are been written. Uh, Nate writes beautiful stuff. Nate and I actually partner, partnered up on a few songs and um, maybe a, one or two of those might be done. Like we, um, he comes here. I went there to uh, Sheboygan, Michigan, mm -hmm. where he lives and stayed with him. Yeah. And uh, we recorded, I brought, you know, like the Universal Audio Apollo. It was great. I mean, we made great demos. We're gonna actually use some of those tracks that we recorded in his house. Oh, wow. Running around. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're, we're getting good performances and, and I've, you know, Christopher knows a lot about recording and he's made a few hits, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. with, uh, you know, subsequent to Blind Melon. And uh, I, you know, I picked up stuff along the way. I've definitely learned a lot because I, I finally had space to put stuff, but I built a, stu a real studio in this, you know, I moved uh, a couple now, of years ago. You, uh, you had only been playing guitar, what, about three years when you got signed, is that right? <laughs> No, it was a little longer than that. Like I, I started playing, like I got really serious about it when I was probably around 15. 
Oh, really? Uh, and then um, I know that I saw, well, I can give you the timeline almost exactly because it happened like this. I saw Van Halen on the 1984 tour, oh, wow. but in December of 93, right? At and Memphis I South Coliseum. And, uh, and that was the first concert I went to. And, and uh, you know, before that I'd been sort of into comic books and I lived in a very rural place in Mississippi, you know, I grew up, I grew up in, in very small town, Mississippi, you know, um, and not a lot of people were into this kind of thing at all, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, of course, when I uh, grew my hair out and, you know, started, you know, I, I mean, I was, I, I wasn't like taking drugs or anything like that, <laughs> you, know, I was, you know, but uh, I was playing guitar and doing something nobody had ever seen, right? Like around there, just people just didn't do stuff like that. Right. But, um, Anyway, that's that's when I started. Uh, but I, I I saw them play, and I saw Van Halen, and I thought, you know, that it just blew my mind. Like I I was so used to looking at, uh, you know, comic books and superheroes and things like that, and drawing and whatnot. And then to see, you know, I started to figure out, you know, around you know the age of ten or whatever, that I wasn't actually going to make it as a superhero. I wasn't going to become more. <laughs> <laughs> the powers weren't going to come to me. Right. So. Um, uh, that was sort of the next best thing, right? It's like you see David Lee Roth jumping around in the air and Van Halen right. doing all these sort of histrionics on the guitar. It was fantastic. Yeah. And, um, so uh, I got I got into it and, you know, I, I saved my money and I begged for a guitar. It took me like, you know, I didn't get a guitar until the following year. Mm. It would have been at the end of 84 that I actually got a guitar. What was that? It was the worst guitar ever. <laughs> <laughs> and and but here's the thing it was a bad guitar to begin it was called a gibson and this is a this is a line that died you know it's just somebody had a bad idea they were trying to like play along with like the new style and the sort of mid 80s you know what's that it just didn't work it was called a gibson victory a victory okay and it was it was it weighed it, it felt like you were picking up a a, a railroad tie it was so <laughs> heavy you know, like, I don't like a heavy guitar at all, right. right? They don't resonate the same, you know? I mean, maybe some Magic Les Paul does, but I've never played one. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, so this thing weighed a ton. And, uh, and then, of course, it wouldn't do the thing that Eddie Van Halen did, where he did the dive bomb. So I proceeded to, you know, buy a secondhand uh, Kaler tremolo and try to, dr you know, drill this thing in there myself. And it was after that, it was just toast. Yeah. Like what I ended up with was the tremolo and instead of the long, you know, devastating dive bomb crashing freight train thing, I would get the, it would just go, and it would die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've seen you play so many uh, different uh, guitars. I've seen you play strats. I've seen you play uh, juniors. Uh, what do you, what do you fancy yourself as more of a Fender or Gibson guy? Um, well, to me, you know, uh, I, I definitely spent 20 years playing strats, like, uh, they just felt that, like, there's nothing feels better to sit and play with or stand and play with than a strat to me personally. Yeah. You know, I know everybody's got their preferences, sure, sure. but, <laughs> you know, a neck through the body is a different animal entirely than a bolt on neck. And, and, you know, God bless Leo Fender. I mean, that is a miraculous invention. Yeah. But if you play a, you know, a good Les Paul that like resonates, you know, like they're capable of doing, it's just, you can't beat it. So what I wanted was something maybe more like what Eddie had, which was a, a Strat that sounds like a Les Paul. Yeah. Right. So I kept trying to do things to Strats. And it just was, it never worked. It was just, they just don't have, there's some other, you know, element of girth to, to the Les Paul that, that I don't know exactly where it comes in. But uh, anyway, I went to the Gibson factory and they gave me one in 2008. I went down a line and they had sort of like the, I think they had like 20 of them, just of the exact same looking guitar. It's, it's, it's this one, I'll show you. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a... Um, <clears throat> It's a Les Paul classic. 
right? So it's like, it's not like a custom shop guitar. It's like a, I don't know. I think they like retail for like three grand or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I, I just went down and picked them up and, and, and it's like A, B, A, B, like which one is lighter? Right. And then I would just like listen to it to make sure there's no weird overtones. And I ended up with this one and it's, and it's mine. It's perfect. Is that it's gone that? for its ups and downs, but yeah. once it gets set up right, you know, of course, what I do, I turn it into a custom shop guitar, right? Because I take everything off of it and replace it. And I'm telling you, the Callahan Bridge makes a difference. I don't endorse their products. I pay for them, you know, mm -hmm. asshole. They won't give them to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that like made a huge difference. Yeah. It was like, it, it just rings like a bell, like a, it sounds like a Steinway. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's got that low end roundness to it. And, and these are Lindy Fralin, uh, his PA, real PAS. He's cool. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's a cool guy. Yeah. So, uh, so is that your go-to now? Is that what you use on the new stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. That and, um, and uh, this one, I think almost for the most part, which is uh, <clears throat> this strap. Uh, this is a, um, an 82, 57 reissue or 83, you know, like those guitars are good. Oh yeah. And I have two of them and, um, the other one's kind of, fucked up. I can't <laughs> believe no, it. That's fine. We'll believe it. No problem. <laughs> um, and again, the Callahan bridge, right. Fraylin pickups, uh, and, and you know, the tuning pegs, I think I changed. Right now is that original to your blind melon days? What? Is that original to your blind melon? No, no. That guitar, I had that yellow strat, yellow, that sort of, I don't know what they call that, but it's like a, a ugly, like booger yellow. <laughs> well, and, uh, um, and that guitar, I, that was also, that was a 62 reissue that I bought, like I think maybe the day or the day after we got a record deal. Really? Yeah. They like gave us a bunch of money and we're like, fuck it, we'll get this. And let's go get wasted. You know, it was like that. <laughs> uh, I got that, um, I got that uh, guitar, that yellow guitar there mm -hmm. at Nadine's Music on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, just south of Capitol Records. That's how far I made it out of the record company before I bought a guitar. Did everybody go and buy instruments? What? Did everybody go and buy instruments at that time? You yeah, walked out Yeah, like people bought dumb stuff too that they later regretted. I mean, we bought so much stupid stuff, but anyway, um, because you know, we had, honestly, I was sleeping in the car three months before that. So, yeah, you know, just having money was like, a, I can get, you know, a nice guitar. I didn't have a nice guitar when we got a record deal. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, so that guitar, we were playing, you know, and I recorded almost, I, I think pretty much all of the first record with that guitar through just straight into a, um, a black face basement head, the 6955 Fender basement with the black face plate, mm -hmm. and um, which had been modified by this guy uh, who worked for Neil Young's producer. And let me tell you something, that's two degrees farther away than you need to go. You need to know somebody's work. Like you can't go and like, oh yeah, Neil Young's producer uses this guy. Like. Yeah. I did. He butchered that amp. Um, he turned it into like a master volume type thing. Uh, that never works in, in my mind, ever. So I've never experienced a master volume amp that just sounded like anything other than complete poop. But hey, that's, that's just for me. Everybody's hands make different stuff. But um, anyway, uh, so but I, that was the whole first record, except for I recorded No Rain with a champ. Really? like a, a black face champ, this one. I have that one over there. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, but that's not actually the one, it's a different one. Now, now for the, uh, you know, like the, the good foot demos. So I have a story about the guitar though, which I'll tell you about, but to answer your question. Yeah, yeah, I, I was just gonna ask about uh, the demos, the good foot demos and, and everything that you made up to the first album. It was kind of a whirlwind there. I mean, you guys, yeah. it was fairly quick, wasn't it? 
Yeah, like uh, we had our drummer grew up like our first drummer before Glenn, before he got a record deal. He, he, he grew up in West Hollywood and his parents had a house with a garage. And Brad being the handyman that he is, um, and me just sort of assisting, like turn that thing into like a soundproof room <laughs> and went in there and started, you know, uh, writing with him and uh, writing. Um, and we were looking for a singer. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where we met Shannon. Right. Because um, he, he came over to the, and you know, I, there are pictures of this, of his like first time hanging out with us. Like a friend brought him over uh, who had heard like the song, like Brad and I had written a couple of songs and they were on a tape and you know, somebody heard them and they're like, oh, these guys, maybe they could write songs with this guy who was new in town. And he came over and he sat down and, um, and he played Change on the acoustic guitar and sang it. And I was like, that dude is a complete rock star. You know, he was just, um, he just, it was obvious, you know. Yeah. He, um, like he was definitely, like we, I knew guys out there who had really good musical groups that were auditioning singers for years, like, or like looking to put together a band. Yeah. And I think he was like the third dude that came over and we weren't even trying, you know, it was like, the first two definitely know that one absolutely perfect <laughs> exceeds expectations right oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah and uh, you know I, I told you a story on the phone about uh, how personable he was uh, mm -hmm. when uh, you guys toured with Kravitz I was at several of those shows but the first one we went early and and we're back there uh, around the buses when you guys rolled in in your van and you came out and everybody was so cool and so nice, but Shannon was so personable and so nice. And um, I'll, I'll never forget the time he took with the people that were out there um, and just kind of completing that whole rock star image. He had the voice, he had the look, and he also had the personality to go out. I never saw him behave in a rude way to any person who was a genuine fan of his or the band ever. Like, he was real like that, you know, like, and, and that's really like, but I'll tell you what, I saw him treat all kinds of people in the music business, in law enforcement, <laughs> in all sorts of places, like in just abominable ways. Mm. You know, I mean, he was, he was, if he didn't trust somebody or thought they were trying to exert authority over him, he would react with like, you know, it was kind of like, you know, you bring the knife, I'll bring the bazooka. You know, it was like, that was his, you know. and yeah. he got in a lot of trouble, you know, but, and he had sort of a reputation, but, but the thing is, he was volatile. He did have a, a, a tremendously short fuse. Yeah. But everywhere, you know, before the fuse is burnt out, he's the sweetest person going, you know, but, and like, you know, if he's, if he does something stupid or whatever, he was always the first guy to apologize and, you know. Yeah, and you know, I, I loved him to, you know, we, we, I, I think about him every day. You know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've got, I got a couple more questions about him, but I want to go back to that, that first album. And, you know, I wanted to ask, throughout the tours, did it ever become a point where you were, you or anybody else in the band were like, you know what, we are so much more than the B girl song, you know, and and get tired of of kind of being pigeonholed there, because there was some really good stuff on that first album. Tones of Home was probably one of my favorite songs you ever did. Uh, that song we wrote before, I think, uh, you know, that song really happened when Glenn Jones. So what happened was is I wrote that with Shannon and mm -hmm. Brad. And then uh, we were still with our old drummer and it just kind of didn't work, you know, and then um, just different style, whatever. And then Glenn came in and it was like, holy crap, you know, Glenn's the secret sauce in this band, by the way. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, um, the reason why the band is good is because of Glenn. So, um, <clears throat> you know, historically, I mean, yeah. and, and Shannon was the star. But, but Glenn's musicianship is on another level. Wow. I mean, so, and just like a true artist, like a, a unique approach and just everything about it is perfect. I, I learned to play guitar against his drumming. 
right. which is, you know, and, and you can hear it. It's not, it's not conventional, you know? No, no. Uh, not. That's what rolled the band into like the way that it sent. That's how it happened specifically. Yeah. Like, had I been playing with a four on the floor drummer, you know, I could have been Malcolm Young or even Angus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But was there ever any resentment? Did you ever get tired of, of just being the no rain band? No. Listen, it's better than being the no, no rain band. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, that song is, is, we never really thought we were going to have, if we thought, like, in our minds, we thought, okay, these people just gave us, like, a ton of money mm -hmm. to go and record a record. And, you know, we're, I don't know if we're ever going to write songs that are going to sell like pop songs, you know, because yeah. we were just too, I don't know, I mean, you know, we were, we were a little bit out there, but um, so, uh, and that song was an anomaly you know, in, in a sense, I, but I, we thought there were others, I thought change was a bigger hit than No Rain, just in I terms of the song. <laughs> so, um, but by the time that came out, you know, we had burnt people out. The record had been out for almost two years. It was ridiculous. We wanted to hear another single off this. And that's what's better, by the way, you know, thoughts about that in terms of this sort of new business model that's emerged. But, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, who knew? And, and, and yeah, I guess it's whatever, but we didn't really pay much attention to it, to be honest. Right. Like it's just completely irrelevant mm -hmm. to what we were doing. Right. Like I was not, it wasn't like I'm worried about, you know, how we're being marketed necessarily. I'm like, somebody's marketing us. Yeah. That was how we thought about it. <laughs> you know, it was more like we're doing this, you know, right. Pay as per the agreement, you know, let me ask you about a, uh, a truly classic clip from Saturday night live, Chris Farley dancing around in the big girl outfit when blind melon played Saturday night live. Tell me about that experience. Um, well, we didn't know he was going to do it <laughs> until it was live. Yeah. So that was fun. But, you know, we had been there for a few days already. It's because, like, when you do that show, you know, it's a week-long thing. And so they sort of bring the band in, I think, Thursday, maybe. Mm -hmm. And you go in, and they kind of block you out and tell you where you're going to be. And you meet everybody, and you watch them like they're doing the skits. And, like, you see a bunch of skits that just get peeled off, at the like, right before the show. Really? It's heartbreaking, you know, because like, there's there's stuff that there's stuff that's great, you know what I mean? Like, and you think, well, because <clears throat> the one that we were on was not a good show. I do remember that, and I don't think anybody felt that it was. Mm. But um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, the the guy who hosts it, his name is Jason Patrick, and he's a a serious actor. You know, I mean, he is. He's a great actor, but right. I don't know, like maybe he just wasn't vibing with them or whatever, but like his, uh, I don't know what, how much comedy he has in him. How did uh, you feel about your performance? Uh, I don't think we ever did. Listen, that's not going to work necessarily best for us always. It would now, but back then, you know, we're like at that age and with that sort of excitement level and, and kind of um, pressure, turns into kind of like, all right, we got the bull in the chute, hit him with the, you know, cattle prod, open the gate. That's what it feels like. You know, you're like, your tempo is off. Nobody's like feeling it. And it's weird because you're in this, you know, yeah, this, this studio, like the Letterman show is the worst because he kept the studio at 55 degrees. Right. It was flat out fucking freezing in there. Yeah. Like you, your, your, your hands would be blue, you know? And you walk out, you know, and you stand and you're kind of waiting during the commercial and he's sitting at the desk and he's literally like here to me because of the way the stage was positioned. It's that close. Right. And um, he looked like an undertaker. Oh, was, oh. <laughs> so he had a lot of makeup on, you know, stage makeup and whatever. Yeah. But um, I remember the Letterman show watching and seeing you, you turn and you were smiling at Dave. And I, what was going on there? Do you, do you remember any kind of interaction with you and Dave? Well, well, he said, Shannon told, like, during the, the commercial break, and we weren't supposed to do this. Like, they want you to stand on your mark because they're, you know, they set the cameras during the break, right? Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure they got everything in your framed, right? Because when they come out, he announces and then you go. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> they kind of run a tight ship. 
But <laughs> so we're there and literally like not at the beginning of the commercial, you know, which would have given time for the reset. But like, you know, Shannon got in his position and was standing there and he's like, oh, I should probably tell this joke to David Letterman. And so he runs over behind me and he gets in David Letterman's face and tells this joke that's kind of a little bit getting elaborate, you know, when you're looking at the clock. I'm looking at it and it's like, you know, 15, 14. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then, and, and that's literally what happened. Like he runs back, he tells a joke and David Letterman is, is like, like laugh. I mean, he is cracked up. Like he's, lost. he's really laughing. It was, a, it was a really, you know, inappropriate joke that I'm not going to tell, but. Okay. <laughs> But uh, it's a good one. <laughs> you know, it's a good dirty joke, you know. Okay. So, uh, very adolescent, which, which we were, by the way, very much so. And um, uh, and 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 David Letterman, you know, he was he was just cracked up, and so I was looking at him, and he said something, and I couldn't understand him. I'm looking, at him, I'm kind of like, ah, that's it. <laughs> And there it was, part one of our interview with Roger Stevenson, the guitar player for Blind Melon. Uh, really, really interesting. And uh, just it's just great to hear his stories of uh, back in the day and everything, the whirlwind that they were involved with. we got part two coming up uh, on our next video. But don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, smash the notification bell, and uh, check out guitarwishes.com and our Facebook site. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cruising for a bruising.